Hello and welcome to Dungeons and Drama Nerds. My name is Todd Brian Backus, and today I'll be joined by the cast of Thirsty Sword Lesbians. Today we're here to talk about our first campaign of season three and how it went. Um, so let's go around and share names, pronouns if you like, and roles on the campaign, starting with Tess. Hello, uh, I am Tess, uh, Tess Youth. She, her pronouns, and I GM this season. Excellent. Uh, Miko. Hi, I'm Yiko Gavia. Uh, she, her pronouns, and I was Malta Regina, who uh, was also she, her pronouns. Mm-hmm. Gina. Hi, I'm Gina Femia, and I played Coney on this season of uh, Their Sea Sword Lesbians. Excellent. Percival. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm Percy, or Percival, if you're nasty. Uh, I use he, they, and Z pronouns, <laughs> and I played Adelaide, <laughs> who uses she, her pronouns. <laughs> John John. Hi, I'm John John. I use they he pronouns and I played Nymeria Wu who used she her pronouns. And Leo. Hey y'all, I'm Leo Mock. My pronouns are they them theirs and he him his and I played Rue Gosa who uses Rue or any pronouns if you're nasty. Thanks everybody. <laughs> Um, to kick things off, I know some people here have not played Thirsty Sword Lesbians before, so I want to like focus in on those folks. Um, so for those of you who are wholly new, how did this game go for you? Um, like what were mechanics that you really dug? What were things that caught you off guard? That kind of stuff. Yeah, I've never played it before. I thought it was, I, I always have a hard time learning rules. Like, like flies way over my head. I feel like I have to read things like three or four times and then have it explained to me. But this was relatively easy to understand um, mm -hmm. just because there were a lot fewer of them than other uh, TTRPGs. I like fighting, so I wish the fight mechanics were a little bit more, I don't know, developed. But I understand that that's not necessarily this type of game. I would have liked, you know, in the case of, like, there was definitely some cases where Malta Redina wanted to, like, kick ass. It wasn't quite as well guidelines weren't quite there the way I wanted. Yeah, I can I can see how I would really enjoy this as a really long form game where we had more balance between smooching and sword fighting or smooching as sword fighting, right? Um and I but I, again it was mechanically simple enough as you noticed when we're playing like I it's it's not like you know D D where it's like let me memorize every single one of my moves. It, for us it was like I'm gonna do this thing and Tess would be like I guess it's this role. And like, but that's also a testament to Tess's jamming or gay, gay mastering uh, to make mm -hmm. sure that we like it's it, and it's why I like these systems uh, a testament. Thank you, Leo. <laughs> um, I like systems where the gameplay and the mechanics are integrated in that way, which is to say a little I like it a little loosey goosey and like a little messier and a little more. What is it? Constructivist, I guess, where you'd be like, well, let's apply the rules this way. And so it's it's such a nice break to be able to be like, I want to go do a cool thing with a sword and smooch a lesbian. And Tess says, that's these things. And I go, great, thanks. Uh, it feels like so much less responsibility on me, the player. And my, my, my objective is to tell the story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, this was my second time playing any kind of game like this. And my first time that was like long form because the first time was like a one shot. And I, I was, so I have like truly like nothing to compare it with or to, but I, I was like super nervous about like knowing all the rules and like going in and being like, I must know like everything. And I still like didn't know everything, but then just to like jump on like how great Tess is just being, seeing that like I, I would actually be taken care of that I didn't need to know everything that I could like actually make choices and moves and Tess would be there to be like that's a game play move I think you should do this and I don't know that just like made me feel so great and so I just I loved playing with it and I loved playing with everybody here so that was awesome too we love playing with you um I speaking of I really like how relationship centric the mechanics are so many of the like rules and guidelines and leveling and stuff like that is all based on like how you interact with others and how you give and get experiences 
love that. And I love how many um, opportunities the game gives to subvert tropes. Like it, it gives you these like, you know, these really specific classes, these really specific like, and this is the kind of trope we're leaning into. And then everything that you can select is about and how do you lean away from that trope or what happens to your character when they lean away from it. Uh, and this team was just so great about saying like, yeah, we're going to lean away from it. We're going to try something new. Nice. Um, and then for our more experienced lesbians, if you will, um, what brings you back to TSL? Like, what what do you really love about this system that was exciting to play again? Um, for I, I am a longtime champion of Thirsty Sword Lesbians. I love this game. Um, for me, it's that I, as a player, I have a hard time in games like D and D with. Um, like I'll see people who make these beautiful high concept characters with really interesting objectives and backstories and all these really cool things that they're exploring. And I have a really hard time generating that on my own um, for whatever reason. And I love that Thirsty Sword Lesbians gives you baked into your playbook. Like here is the conflict that you're playing. Here is the thing that you're trying to do. And I have all the information as the player that I need in order to make choices that are interesting around that and to decide, OK, um, how can I add obstacles to that journey? How can I make this interesting? How can I um, play this in a way that is fun? Uh, it, it lets me sort of take a bird's eye view of what I'm doing um, and it gives me something to play right from the very, very beginning so that there's no like floundering around to be like, OK, like, what does my character want? what am I, what am I trying to do? Like, what are, what are, what is the way that I engage with the world? Like it gives you all of that from the beginning in a way that makes it so much easier to think about your relationships with other characters, because you can sort of figure out from the very beginning, how those things interact with each other. Very much the same for me. Um, anyone who knows anything about my role-playing experience knows that, uh, Powered by the Apocalypse games are kind of where I live. Give me Babes in the Wood, give me Masks, give me this, give me Apocalypse World. Like, that's, this is the world I want to play in. Because I think they are so freeform. They give you a chance to push yourself to do weird things. Or push your characters to do weird things. Because you're not sticking to, like, I cast Fireball. Sure, you might throw a Fireball, but you might be doing it to defend somebody. Or you might be doing it to impress somebody. And I think that's really interesting as opposed to just, do I succeed on this role or not? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think um, like one of the things that people were touching on, um, which I really like about this game, is that like you don't need to know all of your own rules, which I think in D&D, like you so much do, but also the GM can't. Like the GM can't understand how all of the different permutations of all of the classes work. Like that's just a lot to put on someone else. But here it's like, yeah, I think that's like plus charm. Like have fun, plus heart, plus wit. Um, you know, that kind of stuff, which is really nice um, to get to do. Um, shifting gears a little, talking about our storytelling for this season. Um, what were some parts of the narrative that like surprised you or places where you pushed in directions that you didn't expect to, um, or just like moments that really excited you thinking back on this little journey into the untamed that we had? I knew that I wanted an enemies to lovers arc. <laughs> <laughs> like I, just, I knew that that was the thing I wanted to make happen. I was like, I'm going to find whoever is my enemy and I'm going to see if this is possible. Um, but then as I was creating Rugosa and as I was learning more about Rue, I was like, oh, I don't think that this is going to be lovers in a traditional. And when I say traditional, I mean like romantic or sexual sense. I think that like I, I found myself really interested in in like what if this were enemies to queer platonic lovers and what might desire and infatuation look like in a non-romantic non-sexual sense um and so that was just a really fun thing to like play and then leave the zoom and be like whoa what is that what does that mean like 
I feel like I learned a new way to relate <laughs> or like I, I learned a new kind of relationship in a way that I'm, I'm still stewing on. Um, Rue and Malta Regina's relationship was very much like a, you know, that meme where, where the, where the two hands are like clasping, the two really muscular hands are like clasping. <laughs> yeah. I felt like that. Yeah. I don't like when I have like queer platonic relationships, very like, flowery and like it makes me feel like woo woo all the time like it just feels like very like bubbly and light and sweet and pink and sparkly but this one was like yeah we got this <laughs> Rose. it was yeah it was it was very like that and I really appreciated it I don't explore that a lot from the like first recording session that we did I had zero idea where like where the story was going at all I had no idea what was going to happen I was like we're fighting this megafauna or other people are fighting this megafauna I am decidedly not <laughs> um and then suddenly it was like boom capitalism um which I didn't like it makes sense like it's made total sense and it was a delightful surprise that we got to grapple with these like very big questions of like um who gets to decide what is done with the land and like who gets to make decisions on behalf of other people um, and who exercises power in order to do that. Like all of these questions are things that I wasn't expecting to come up, but I felt like the way that we were grappling with them felt really earned and that was cool um, and exciting, but I definitely did not see that uh, coming. I know that I went in wanting like and expecting for my character to make a lot of romantic connections or romantic relationships. And so I was really surprised, but then thrilled that Coney and Adelaide became like an OTP. <laughs> and it, I just thought that was so beautiful and delightful and something that really went against, you know, I, I kind of like picked a character that was like, wants to like hook up <laughs> with other people so that I could like do that. But, but then it was just like, so I thought it was just like a sweet way to move into that. Um, so I was really surprised by that in a pleasant way. I was also surprised by that because I was like, when is Coney going to break Adelaide's heart? Like, when is it? When is the turn going to happen? And I was waiting and waiting and waiting and it never did. And it felt like so nice. I think there is a sort of echo to the apocalypse world that Tess and I were in that there is something about this like a post-apocalyptic eh, world uh and we all chose to go for the most wholesome things um like there there is always the potential for edge and we all were like who wants that and we all went straight for like what's fun what's cute trains uh <laughs> trains and dogs right and it was like yeah which is the same thing, like with like with uh, Leo, it was like eggs. It's going to be about eggs, you know. <laughs> and like, so I think that's always something that's very delightful about um, ru lighter rules systems games is that uh, when the storytelling is collaborative that way, we as a group kind of find what's important to us. As opposed, and I think again, like I'm just going to keep bragging on Tess, being like to have that flexibility to be able to pick out what the players are automatically gravitating towards and then building off of that, uh, which is why we wound up, I think, with probably fewer violent fights and more capitalism. Mm. Um, and I think part, and, and for myself, to, to answer the original question, the first thing that I was really curious about that I wanted to sort of keep close to chest is the number five in a game where there's romances and because there would be typically like people pairing off. And so was it going to be pairs and people staying behind? Were we going to look at poly relationships with thruple, uh, thruples and Vs and more bigger constellations? So I was actually just kind of gently curious to see how it was not evenly built at the beginning for heteronormative sort of understandings of relationships. So what that formula was going to be. And it looked like we had like two pairings and then Nymeria was about awakening and being like, oh, maybe I'm not straight. Uh, what if I'm cute, uh, but I'm a cheerleader, like that old, <laughs> right? Uh, so th those are things I was really curious to see, like what relationship dynamics would form. And it was really cool to see how they happened as a result, because there wasn't an even set of pairing up from the get-go because of the number of people invited to the game, which I think is very important. Yeah. 
Um, we we touched on this a little bit, but w- one of the things that I really enjoy about Thirsty Sword Lesbians is it encourages flirting both with NPCs and across the table, which a lot of games push back against, kind of, but a lot of people end up doing anyway. Um, and so I wanted to know, like, even if it wasn't your character, who were you shipping the most? It's Connie and Adelaide for me. I could see myself pairing up with either Rue or Nymeria, but Connie and Adelaide are my GP. I think for me, there was a sense of, like, if Rue got to know Nymeria for like more time as Nymeria was like coming into herself, then like I imagine a very cozy cottage with Nymeria and Malta Regina. And like who knows what that relationship would look like, but I think that they would be like a happy home and a well balanced home. I mean, it feels like bad for me to be like, I love Cody and Adelaide, <laughs> but I do. I, I'm I'm coming out officially as a person who is never in D&D as a DM, like run flirty NPCs. Like it's just not a thing that I jump to for whatever reason. Um, like my experience with like flirting with other characters in tabletop games is very, very minimal. Like it is it is not a thing that I do a lot. So this was like very new for me, actually. Um, but it was really it was really fun. Um, yeah, like it just—it just feels. It just felt really nice, and it felt. Um, I don't know. It felt nice to tell a story um, about a clearly like neurodivergent character who is not struggling with that in a romantic context. Like it's just not really a factor or an obstacle in their like romantic pursuits. Um, like that was cool. When I was in high school, I uh, did. Harry Potter live journal role playing with yes. <laughs> some of my sister's friends. Yes. And I was, I was Remus Lupin and I was Cho Chang. And Cho Chang uh, ended up having a relationship with, I think it was George Weasley. And so there's just a bunch of like shipping going on. It was weird because I, I was very, but I'm a cheerleader where I was like, I'm straight, but I'm like doing heterosexual role playing with someone who was actually another girl and we're getting romantic and I don't know how I feel about this this is weird for me so doing shipping in the form of role playing has always been like a very weird headspace for me but like this was really easy and soft and like cute um versus being filled with like anxiety and worrying if I was like pushing somebody's boundaries because like the boundaries were very clearly defined in the start of the game, which you don't often get if you're doing like D&D or their role-playing games that aren't set up for flirting. So um, yeah, this felt really, it felt really nice and cute. And like at the end of the day, everybody was friendly and nobody felt creeped out. Mm -hmm. Very important to not (laughs) feel gross at your table with flirting. I've played a lot of games where flirting is encouraged um but not mechanized and i think that's one thing that i really love about thirsty sword lesbians is they give you benefits for flirting um monster hearts and monster hearts 2 also do that um though it's less benefits for flirting and more benefits for fucking but still i mean that is their romantic romantic sexual things are mechanized and there is a reason to do them. Um, but I've played this game a couple times and like the flirting always gets kind of mean because I think it is like we're coming from the enemies to lovers place. Um, but yeah, like Miyako was saying, like it was so gentle, even though it was like happening all in really stressful situations, it was never aggressive. And I really loved that. And I wanted to piggyback off on the not mechanized. Like, I I guess I'll reveal, like, some personal info where it's, like, I'm, like, seeing someone who I started dating in a game in character. And, like, I want to point out that, like, so much transference happens. As, uh, you know, this is a also a theater podcast. Like, <laughs> in roles where I've had to be in love with someone, 
there, the Venn diagram of my body chemistry is a perfect circle because I'm saying, okay, be in love with this person. My body goes, okay, produce all the same chemicals. And then I'm like, okay, I'm not actually in love with them. And my body's like, I don't get it. And so like the number of times I've developed like really like crushes on people because I had to be romantic with them in just a short scene. I've always been very wary about approaching romances in games where they're not mechanized as well. And so, I, and I say that as someone who is now like seeing someone who we started dating in game and now in person. And so, and like in the real world outside the matrix. And so, but I've also been very typically hesitant on romances and games. Like, and when I do the flirting, it's usually as a DM as some sort of like elder horror or demon that's like, if you succumb to the flirting, I'm going to eat you, which is different than like, um, you know, now we're going to go into a relationship, which is worse than being consumed by the cosmic unknown, right? So <laughs> uh, so I really appreciate the feeling of safety that the mechanics bring because the number of times I have been running romantic, like or ro ro run romantic relationships with NPCs as a DM or with player characters, there's a lot of like, I feel like I have to put my own, not my own personal safety, but my own personal feelings do creep in there. And mm -hmm. so it's, you know, let's let's tie it back to theater also, where it's like having mechanics feels like having an intimacy coordinator in the room, where it's like, I know that I have boundaries, I know that I have things, and I know that I have mechanized way to say, actually, I don't want to go there. Uh, and so that I wanted to make that very clear as to why I am more comfortable flirting in a game like Thirsty Sword Lesbian with the mechanics, and then I somehow still chose not to. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And like to to keep it in the theater world for a moment longer, this is a reason why, like in the intimacy direction toolbox, we have not only like boundaries and limits, um, but like when we are doing things like chemistry exercises and connection exercises, there's a closure at the end. So we don't just say to actors like, hey, build all this and uh, chemistry, build all this connection. Now do the scene. Now go about your lives because like that's what happens. We are training actors to like either literally or simulate these like dopamine releases through body language. And we can't just be like, all right, you're good now. Go on break. Um, and so these mechanics are so important to be able to say like, yeah, have big feelings, have big feelings for your character as your character and like have a nice way to keep them in character. I don't think I ever had like an intimacy coordination experience. I had like you know, directors who were very uh, aware of it, but I've never had somebody to do that specifically and never been in like best circumstances where you don't have any like icky feelings towards your scene partner. It's like having that thing of like, okay, we're going to turn these on and then we're going to turn them off. And here's a mechanism to like step back out of that role so that things don't, you know, the lines don't get crossed. People don't, things don't bleed into each other. So that's something I'd never thought about in terms of um, intimacy coordination. So that's really cool. Yeah. D-rolling is super, super important. Um, shifting gears a bit. Um, like Carol Danvers, many people wanted to go higher, further, and faster than we got to go in this campaign. You're all welcome. There's a lot of faces being made at me, but you're all welcome. Um, what are something that what are some things that you would have liked your character to explore if we had more time? Like if we had another couple of sessions, what's something you really would have wanted your character to get to do? And Tess also like, what are things that you would have wanted to? I wanted to sword fight more for sure. And I found myself getting, I, I couldn't find the balance between like the emotional side and the sword fight side. Cause I think that there were points that I could have sword fought a bit more, but I got caught up in the other side of things and still just like, I, I was like, wait, I could have totally drawn my sword. Oops. Okay. <laughs> it's going on. That's fine. Um, but that's something. And I also would have been curious if um, there would have been more of a poly feel to the relationships in, in the game. Um, if we had more time to like explore all of that. Um, Cause I feel like we ended where all of our relationships, we just got together like at the end. 
is how I felt. And I was, I was just like, oh, the things this group could do if they went on like together and went on more adventures, there would have been so much more. Uh, so there was just like so much. Yeah, I would have liked to see Malta Regina be, have more of a struggle between um, vulnerability and, and being like closed off. Um, she didn't really, she didn't really do talk too much about her girlfriend. She didn't really open up to Rue as much as, uh, much as I would have liked. I think it was just because she was very focused on like giving herself to everyone and like getting through the storyline. But I think that with more extended play, a lot of the, the more I guess dynamic nature of her her character and her character arc would have come out more. Besides the cliffhanger that I dropped at the end, which I always do in a one shot because I'm a monster, um, I loved the culture that you all built at the beginning of it um, in our like world building, um, like especially the weird stuff in it, like dolphins are enemies in this world, and like fruits and stone fruits are really generous gifts. Like there's just so much unique granular world building. And I think if this had gone on longer, I would have loved to see more interactions with other parts of the world to see like where the culture takes you all. My kind of like maybe selfish answer to this question aside from what like we have to get the seeds back from the people, obviously I was like, I want, I want, I would have taken, like, I wanted to see a trip where Adelaide took Coney to like the world of the unseen Um, <laughs> would have been specifically really fun. But also I feel like in the same vein of what Gina said, it would have been cool to sort of see how these sort of new relationships evolved and whether there was like some Adelaide and Coney drama um, or some some scoundrel behavior. Um, scoundrel behavior. Yeah. Honestly, I would love to see some relational messiness within these mechanics, like jealousy and breakups or de-escalations or like shifting relationships um, and what that could look like. I think that this game has like really lovely heartbreak mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> this feels very like <laughs> this feels very cancerian of me to say like yeah I want to talk about how what it's like to get sad in this world <laughs> I, but I think that does point to a larger part of like the queer and the LGBTQ plus zeitgeist right now is that I feel like too many queer relationships are precious and therefore are always very neat and tidy because we're not allowed to represent the the messiness of it like and then when we do, it very quickly like borders into like, I think about what was it, the one with that, that Kirsten Stewart movie, the Christmas movie, where it's like there's Christmas magic, but like the partner is like abusive and gaslighty, but then via Christmas magic, they end up back together where Kristen Stewart should have ended up with Aubrey Plaza. So it's like, okay, well then you mm. go the other way where it's like, well, now you're, you're celebrating like actually regardless of gender, bad behavior, you know, like bad act like not bad acting, but like bad relationship tropes are being celebrated here. Mm -hmm. And so I think as, as queer folk playing a game where we're focusing on lesbian relationships, I think there is always a desire to present it very neatly because it's almost like, I think we're still in that phase societally where we have to prove to the straights that our relationships are worthy and therefore must be perfect. Whereas I I am longing for the world where they are allowed to be as messy as and complex as the individuals that are in those relationships. As a playwright, that's something I've been running into a lot. And like audio drama writing is I want all of my characters to be queer, but there have to be villains or people who are antagonistic. And so I'm writing a non-binary character who's just a monster and it's like, are we at a place society where we can do that? Where that doesn't just make the queer community look bad? And it's such a tricky line right now because of gestures at the world. Um, like, 
I think every time I meet someone as a trans woman, I'm like, I have to be like the best version of myself because what if I'm the only trans person this person meets and then they are violent to another person because I treat them badly. There's a lot of pressure to be queer right now. No, oh, yeah. I, and I hope this won't sound like trite or whatever, but I think a lot about disgraced um, and how like, I think it is, an okay play like a, a probably better than average play but there was all of this onus put on disgraced because it's like the first tragedy with a middle eastern american man in it um and so like he also like we want him to be the best guy because like there aren't a lot of those figures in american theater and so like why did we have to have a shitty guy be the first guy um and i think so often about like willie loman in this context and like Willie Loman is the worst fucking dude. Like he sucks. He just sucks. And like straight white dudes get to do that and it not damage everything else for everyone else. And I want everyone to be able to be a Willie Loman, if that makes sense. Like I want everyone to be able to have like, we have a touchstone of like an incredibly shitty character. Um, and we don't hate, everyone else of that group for that and like we even celebrate a lot of other people because of that you know more mediocre queers <laughs> more mediocre queers what i will say that what this is also making me think of though is almost like the flip side of it because i'm thinking about like a common reason that people say they play like D D is like it's a power fantasy it's getting to feel like like you have all of these cool abilities and you can make this change that you can see immediately um, and that feels really great. And I'm what like, I don't know, like a power fantasy for me is like having a healthy relationship. <laughs> that sounds so sad. A power fan it's like having a relationship that feels just really nice and where like you have no personal real life stake in it. So you can just have this like lovely um relationship blossom and feel what that's like. And like, yeah, maybe it becomes messy later, but I feel like it is nice to have a game that is sort of about that at least as importantly as it is about like defeating toxic powers and saving the world and doing heroic stuff. Like it's also um, like, it feels really good to feel invited to have like a beautiful, wholesome queer relationship um, because many games don't make space for that explicitly. You have to sort of just decide that you're going to do that. So like that is, that is a nice thing that I like very much about the system is that it's like, Oh, this is encouraged and almost required. Um, <laughs> Uh, and actually, conversely, I really like playing the bad guy. Like, I think it's it's super fun. Like, everyone loves a good villain. But, you know, don't... Sometimes I want my villains to represent me. <laughs> not like, you know, not like a... Uh, yeah, not like an... Uh, what is it? Ambiguous queerness queer baiting. But like, no, actually, actually a shittier character who is... Meet mm -hmm. your queers, but your queers. Uh, <laughs> I mean, like, range. genuinely, that's what I like so much about our flag means death. Like, no one get mad at me. I don't think it's like the platonic ideal of an excellent TV show. Like, it's not. <laughs> it is not the soundest story that I've ever seen, but it depicts an extremely messy gay relationship. <laughs> um, it's it's just so messy, and it like embraces queerness and all its messiness, and it is explicitly queer. Like that is what I like so much about it. Is it's just like fun television for gay people that is not trying to be excellent representation because they are literally all criminals. Um, <laughs> love the character of calico jack like he's a horrible person but he's funny as hell and he's like yeah i'll have sex with you like i know many gay people like that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just nasty nasty yeah. individuals we, don't we nasty <laughs> but i think that's the thing we, we try so hard to hide because of the puritanism and religious mm -hmm. and whatnot it's like like, you know, we talk about how it's like, man, cis gay men suck. Cis gay white men suck. Uh, but we can't tell the straights that because then they'll take away all of our rights. Right. And that's what this has got me thinking is like queer people are regularly villains to other queer people because there are so many other ways to like 
be oppressive. There is white supremacy and there is like still cis patriarchy and there is still class and there like are still all these other ways for queers to be villains. And like, I think that that's really worth talking about and playing about. Mm -hmm. Tess, I was wondering, um, since we did end on a cliffhanger, if you could give the players a peek as to where things might have gone next for you. I know it's, you know, always, always hurting cats, but. If I had to guess, if I had to like write the story now, I'm writing the novel from this. Um, I would say we're probably going towards the water next, uh, towards the float somewhere, because a lot of the storylines that we have Nymeria's past and um, uh, Virgosa's past are both water-based. We've now tied that company to the water. And I think that we want to head back towards where the quote-unquote root of evil of Kell Enterprises is. The water also right now is the biggest threat because of uh, because of the people of the salt there is a lot of pressure on you all to, you know, stop the world from ending, um, both by fire from Kell Enterprises and by water uh, from the people of the salt. So there's some really fun mileage. Plus, um, as John John pointed out, uh, bad dolphins. (laughs) Uh, Excellent. 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 Um, Cast, do you have any questions for Tess? Um, Like, are there any things that you wanted to know that you didn't get to know um, or stuff like that? And again, no pressure. And I feel like I have a leading question, but that's because I'm one of Tess's regular players. Is a lead me. I'm ready. Lead you. It's just a, what is your process for building? Would you have thrown a curveball? Oh, I don't build. Oh, I don't prep anything. I, uh, when a curveball comes, I'm like, fuck, I don't know how to catch that curveball. And I switch to another player as soon as they introduce something that I need to work around. Um, so Nymeria wandered off. And then um, when you failed that role, John John, and like got knocked out in the train, I was like, I don't know where we go from here. So I'm going to switch back to the other group because it gives a second for the world to kind of sink in. Um And then figure out what is the most dramatically interesting, challenging, and often dangerous choice to make. Um, One thing about this game, it has a little bit mechanized, but not as much as some other PBTA games, are there are negative consequences to failure. Failure helps you progress. Failure helps you improve. But also there is a clear, like, when this happens, this happens. Um, So it's easy to fall back on the mechanics there. When I am tripping up on what to do next, it's easy to be like, okay, well, this person just failed this role. They need a consequence. Okay, it's going to come from here. I'm not sure how much I was thrown by this group. Um, But to be fair, I as a GM didn't, or as a game master, didn't leave too much space like when we played uh the apocalypse world game and the blades in the dark game there was so much world built around you all or built around us um that there was so much to explore and there was a lot of player agency i don't think i gave you as much in this one um which isn't normally how i run things but i do like where it went and you all still surprised me in a lot of ways just not as much as I would normally. No one is knocking down a building in an attack here. I don't have to like deal with that side of things. So many hard choices though that could have had like very bad consequences if someone else didn't intervene. <laughs> that is true. Um, I have a question. What it's kind of the opposite question, but what was a moment where this game together perfectly like you 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 set it up and we just like hit it out of the park like what talk about those moments and some of your favorites if they happen they might not happen 
Um, the final like shot of the first recording session, um, with all of you on the back of this megafauna looking towards this like rising column of smoke um across the untamed, like that was a moment that I could not have planned any better. It's kind of where I wanted this to end up. Um everything on either side of it surprised me. But that moment was one that I was kind of hoping to hit. And it was a really good one to end on for that session. I'm always surprised at how people and how GMs and um, Dungeons and Drama Nerds manage to end everything on a perfect note. Where everyone I've been in, we've all ended at the perfect cliffhanger. For what it's worth, I have run uh, a lot of games um, for podcasting. And it is just about finding that narrative arc. It's about being like, cool, I know we have 10 minutes left. We have to get to somewhere. That's a good conclusion. I'm going to kind of, I don't want to say force, but like encourage the players to go in a direction that will give me a satisfying conclusion. It's good to know because whenever I DM, I'm always like, ah, okay, I guess we're going to stop here. <laughs> that is like 90% of GMing is just that noise in your head. Mm. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Excellent. Um, and then to flip the script, Tess, is there anything you'd like to ask the players? You all basically unanimously decided on the Untamed. Like, everyone was like, it could be this or this, but everyone had the Untamed in their, like, idea. What drew you to that location? As opposed to the Sheer, which was like the cities carved into the cliff sides. Or the swings in the jungles. Like, what drew you to this, like, open grassland? I liked that it didn't have much of a predetermined um, class structure or government or anything like that. Um, I was interested in, like, maybe other people being from those kinds of systems and then coming together and seeing what happened. But I liked that it was more sort of loose um, and up for us to sort of figure out what that looks like. It felt the most earthy to me and I wanted to be there um I also did really like the idea of like water but I wasn't like the biggest fan of how that world I can't remember what it's called um like the one the float the float I like the the way that it was described like the every the systems that were already set up I was I didn't really I wasn't as drawn to that idea as I was like what Percy said of like there wasn't much set up but also just for me like the visual of it was really appealing I like the danger of the untamed it felt very cinematic to me so I could just picture um Walter Regina just standing like looking over the seas of grain with the cape like swaying in the wind <laughs> yeah a very Walter Regina answer and also I really liked the idea of the float i thought it had a lot of dramatic potential but it's an it's at the end of the day it's an enclosed space right the other ones are like they have very defined boundaries whereas the untamed when i thought about it it just went on forever so i felt that you know this would be a, a better place for Walter regina because she can you know run away hide or things wherever she needs to um but also it seemed more versatile for our needs. When you said think Kipo and the Age of Wonder Beasts, and I just kept thinking about how vast that world is, even though like the the you know the story is very contained to like a set of characters, but the the way they've designed the world, it feels huge, it feels wide and vast. And so that's what drew me to the untamed was I was like, oh, there's the the harmonic resonance I'm looking for. Yeah, that's what I was about to point out there is like you all picked The Untamed. I don't know how many of you have seen Kipo, but like so much of the world building came from that and she and a lot of these like classic cartoons, classic modern cartoons, kids cartoons. And it, it gave me a lot of things to play with so much so that I was like, I have to make sure that I'm not actively doing something that's in the thing already. Um when I knew it was the Untamed when I went to build the first session, my first thought was Giant Dog. And then I was like, that is a direct ripoff from Kipo. I can't do that. Hold, please. Which is why I was like, it's this megafauna that doesn't have a defined species. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, in my head it was a moose. <laughs> I thought it was like a moose. <laughs> I was getting very like Mononoke forest spirit vibes. I kind of was just picturing like an animal shaped ghillie suit. <laughs> nice. Thank you all so much for playing, folks. Is there anything that you want to plug that's coming up soon? Uh, I can go. Um, Moon Harbor Heroes, uh, the podcast that John John and I are on, um, that I'm one of the producers of, uh, comes back right around the time that this is released. Um, And we are starting a brand new season um, with brand new characters. So it's a really good time uh, to jump on, as opposed to trying to get through the 150 episodes of Backlog for both of our two storylines. This is brand new. John John is once again on it. It's delightful. And um, yeah, you should check it out. Yeah, I'm main cast and very sad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very excited to hear what not Coda is for you. I, whenever I play a character, I always try to build a polar opposite next. Nice. Um, I don't have anything coming up within the next few weeks. I just want to say, you know, uh, I got I got stuff coming. Like, all of my projects are, like, in the pipeline for, like, early 2023. Mm -hmm. So, if you want to keep up with what I'm up to, um, you can check out my Facebook, which is artist, or my Twitter, which is at miyakogavia, or my Insta, which is S-O-O underscore grid. So grid, like in Homestar Runner. Follow me. Like Miko, I'm I don't have anything coming up up, uh, but I would actually like to say that I do have a book coming out next April and pre-orders are available. It's called Alondra and it's written by me, Gina Femi. <laughs> um, and so if anybody wants to pre-order a YA book about a a group of kids, teenagers that get together and create an amateur wrestling team and the playgrounds. And it's also very queer. Think about adding a Laundra to your pre-order list. Excellent. How exciting. Congrats. Looking forward to it. Um, wonderful. Well, uh, thanks so much for joining us, folks. Um, we'll be going on a brief hiatus for the next couple of weeks, but we'll be back in mid-November to kick off our Brindlewood Bay campaign. So, Brush up on your Jessica Fletcher in the Instagram, and we'll see you soon. Dungeons and Drama Nerds is produced by Top Ryan Backus, Percival Hornack, and Nicholas Orbis, and is mixed and edited by Anthony Sorteltine. Our Thirsty Sword Lesbians campaign features Gina Famia as Coney Shiversville, Miekio Gavia as Malta Regina, Percival Hornack as Adelaide, John John Johnson as Nymeria Wu, Leo Mock as Rugosa, and this game is Gay Mastered by Tess Huth. If you'd like to help us continue exploring the intersection of theater and tabletop role-playing games, consider leaving us a review on your podcast app of choice, or supporting us and getting access to our patron-only bonus content at patreon.com slash dungeonsanddramanerds. You can find our social media and website links, including our cast bios, in the link tree in our show notes, and be sure to tune in next week for another episode of Dungeons and Drama Nerds. Dungeons and Drama Nerds.